Hello. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to Verto FX and Global Treasurer webinar um, titled Cross-Border Payments in Africa from Pain Point to Growth Accelerator. I'm Aaron Fronda, Managing Editor of the Global Treasurer, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Um, just before we kick things off, I wanted to mention that we will be answering audience questions at the end of the webinar. So if you'd like to ask a question, please submit them using the chat box displayed on your screen. Also, if you have any technical questions or problems, please also submit those through the same chat box and a, and a support staff member will, will quickly assist you with any issues that you're facing. Uh, additionally, I want to draw your attention to the related content section of your console. We have added content and links to additional resources on this topic for you to explore at your leisure. And lastly, please note that you can adjust your console to best suit your needs. Um, we do, however, recommend keeping the media player as your main window as we will not be making making use of informative slides in this session, but instead we'll be focusing just strictly on our panel and, and on everything that they have to share with us today. Um, so with that out of the way, um, let's meet today's panelists. Um, first, we have Anthony Odu, the co-founder, CTO and CPO of Verto FX, a B2B payment solution facilitating commerce for cross-border merchants. Anthony is a serial entrepreneur with a background in finance and Verto FX has even recently been awarded a FinTech Startup of the Year Award this year. Uh, secondly, we have Jessica Anuna, the founder and CEO of Plasha, a financial technology company on a mission to build cross-border payment solutions for African consumers. Uh, Jessica is an entrepreneur with a background in e-commerce and business development, and she was recently featured as a new wealth creator in Africa by African Forbes Women. And thirdly, and lastly, but definitely not our, uh, by no means least, we have uh, Abadou Karimu Sule, CFO of e Eterna. Uh, Abadou Karimu um, has over 13 years extensive experience managing financial operations, providing quality financial advisory and coordinating treasury and investment operations in the oil and gas sector. So thank you to all of you for joining us today. Thank you. So to kick things off, I th I'm going to be talking to you, Anthony and, and Jess. Um, so according to a recent McKinsey article, um, there are four forces shaping the outlook for e-payments in Africa. Favorable demographics uh, and economic growth, technology innovation uh, and advances in payments infrastructure. Do you agree with this? And, and could you elaborate on what you believe are the driving forces shaping the outlook of e-payments in Africa at the moment? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll probably go first. Um, no worries. Just do I go first? Go for it, Anthony. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I, I totally agree. Um, I personally believe um, technology innovation has been the driving force, at least from my point of view. Um, and you can see a lot of that in when it comes to consumer spending, how goods and services are being purchased today. And increasingly, we are actually seeing more transactions are being done digitally through electronic payment, bank transfers, wallets, and even cryptocurrency today. So mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, yes, that is something that is driving uh, innovation on the continent. Um, also, as a, as, a, as a continent that I'm aware of, uh, I would say a lot of innovation of taking place in payments as well. We've seen an influx of um, investment from VCs, and most of them have gone towards FinTech that are solving that problem. Um, so yeah, I do agree. And Jess, any insights from you? <laughs> I would also agree with Anthony. Um, as we know, 10% of transactions in Africa are digital, and there's an increasing number of users that are coming online in Africa. I think 22% of the population in Africa are now online wanting to transact, especially as their economy grows and as consumerism increases on the continent. And more importantly, as consumers are becoming more demanding and sophisticated here in Africa. So I think because of this, payment companies are having to cater to this new type of customer and introduce solutions like in finance, um, that, on, that not only serves the African consumer, but also optimizes the fragmented payment structure on the continent. So I'm looking forward to seeing a more interconnected uh, ecosystem on the payment side here in Africa, but we're really seeing things increase given that Africa is the fastest growing econ economy in the world. Um, and we're looking at payment companies providing more solutions to cater to, to the consumers here on the ground. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we've also we've seen a migration of focus by big tech such as Amazon taking an active interest in, in Africa. Obviously, given Africa's 40 plus currencies, what um, payments and treasury capabilities would big tech require to scale in the continent? Um, and I'd like to bring in Abdul Karimu, if, if I can, on this one first. OK, 
Okay, uh, right. The migration of focus by big tech into Africa is expected because as of today, Africa is the world's second largest and second most populous continent after Asia. Um, Africa has approximately over 1.3 million population and uh, any multinational company that's showing interest in Africa stands to deliver products in the second largest market in the world. Uh, with about 54 currencies with no unifying currency between them, unlike what we see in the Europe and America, where the dollar and the pounds is predominantly the operating currency. Um, uh, there lies opportunities in uh, um, for the big tech in Africa, um, where in, um, individuals who want to buy items in their local currency, for instance, I'm in Nigeria, I want to buy an item in Nigeria in my currency, but, you know, the technology will take place and every conversion takes place online. Um, this will mean there's need for collaboration. Uh, with the local currency regulators of each country, as well as financial institutions, um, increase their claim satisfaction, trust with a wider and evolving set of products and services. Um, there's, there's need for continuous innovation to meet the need of customers in a seamless manner. And lastly, there could um, they could also go into partnership with the existing local banks to gain some expertise in this field. Uh, basically, yeah, uh, to respond to that question. Yeah, and, and, and again, same question to, to Jess and Anthony. So what, what payments and treasury capabilities would Big Tech require to scale um, in, in Africa? Jess? I think on the payment side, um, you know, quite simply accepting a multitude of different payment methods commonly used in Africa. Um, in OECD economies and frontier markets, we see car payments being used as the number one method of payment acceptance. But here in Africa, car penetration is only 0.4%. So, so for companies like Amazon to get to critical mass, they really need to adopt commonly used payment methods across the continent. Um, on the treasury side of thing, I think having solid liquid, uh, liquidity contingencies across the continent, given the continuous fluctuation of African currencies, uh, FX volatility will be extremely challenging for multinationals scaling into the continent. So holding liquidity positions in the different African countries they operate in, as well as um, in countries outside of the continent, will be key uh, for them to be able to scale across the region. Um, and then I think lastly, maybe, you know, marking up prices to account for currency volatility, you know, factoring the exchange spread and where they can maybe lose money given the continuous uh, fluctuation of the currencies on the ground in Africa. Um, and then just as a quick last point, just really building their back end infrastructure to account for things like payment outages. Um, how do you make a payment with bank transfer, for example, in Nigeria, which can take, you know, 20 or 30 minutes to be accepted as a consumer? You know, that isn't a good consumer experience. So how do you build into your back end a capability that accepts the payment maybe um, ahead of the payment being confirmed by the bank and then remit so that the purchase can actually be dispatched? So I think those are the few things that companies that have to have to focus on. So it's a clearly a, a sort of a focus on localization. Um, any additional insights from you, Anthony, if we move on to the next question? Yeah. I totally agree with um, uh, most of the uh, just point. Uh, I definitely think there's a need for a very good and efficient cross-border payment. So given the, the, the fact that about 40 currencies on the continent, what you want is a way to actually move across the border without the need to have to swap every single currency, whether in real time. Uh, and that brings a lot of challenges. You have a liquidity problem that I just mentioned. You have settlement problems and a lot of issues around that. So imagine a situation where you're actually able to do any transaction across the border without the need to cost to USD. So there's no more base currency that is back to USD. That would definitely increase the, um, the amount of capabilities on the continent. And the tertiary side is super important because when you think about the big tech or big uh, organization coming to Africa, what you want to have is ability to move treasury easily within every continent or country that you're based in. So you want to, be able to move money from A to B. So imagine if you don't have to do any cost currency, you actually can just grow within the country and uh, repatriate if we have to, but we actually go in that country because there's no FX risk associated with your transactions. And sort of moving on sort of quite naturally now to this next question. So, you know, Africa is considered the birthplace of mobile money for consumer payments. Um, however, business payments continue to lag in innovation. Um, my question to, to the panel is what, what role do fintechs play in connecting businesses, merchants, 
on the continent and big tech through payments. Um, Anthony, back to you, if, if we could start with you this time. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll probably say that that's not um, completely true in terms of uh, um, businesses are not moving forward when it comes to innovation or unemployment. Uh, because when you look at the moment pop shop, the small SMAs and so on, they actually are using a lot of these uh, mobile payment solutions that are available today. And a good example can be seen in East Africa around Inversa. Um, but obviously, when you kind of scale that up to uh, multinationals, uh, big global businesses that are moving money across the world, that kind of that kind of solution doesn't work, which is where you need a good cross-border payment solutions, which again, some of the local banking solutions or providers are, are not uh, necessarily connected enough. There's no right corresponding relationship between the bigger boys in Europe or US that tend to move the dollars around. So ultimately, what you get is um, a lot of fintechs are stepping into this. And the fintechs are stepping in, trying to like either bundling or unbundling different infrastructures or building their infrastructure from scratch to allow these businesses to actually operate in, 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 the, in the continent. Um, so I would say uh, a good example can be seen where in Europe, for example, there's an open banking um, regulation that literally almost like driving the driving force behind uh, ability to share um, transactions and values or numbers or data. But when it goes to Africa, this thing has been done in, in the most reverse engineering side of it where there's no regulation. We have all these startup in a few countries doing the same thing, being able to plug into a system bank infrastructure and allow FinTech to plug into that solution to do a lot of things. So yeah, mm -hmm. that would be my take on topic. Okay. And, and again, um, sort of what role do fintechs play then um, in, 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 this, in this space, Jess, if you could add any additional insights? Yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of innovation happening uh, with fintechs trying to solve the whole B2B money movement problem, um, particularly in cross-border payments. I also disagree that, um, you know, there's a lack of innovation when it comes to uh, payments in, on the B2B side. Africa is indeed the birthplace of mobile money, but especially at Cash, we're seeing businesses adopt a multitude of payment methods to make purchases. I mentioned earlier that card penetration is pretty low in Africa, 0.4%. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing is a lot of people using money methods like USSD, M-Pesa, mobile money, and even moving money wallet to wallet, right? M-Pesa in Kenya to wallets in Ghana. Um, we have been text like Dash creating uh, payment solutions to um, serve merchants that way. So I think there's a lot of innovation um, coming out of the context to solve this problem, given that, you know, for example, China's Africa's trading partner. How does one move money seamlessly from Africa to China to pay for goods and services on the B2B side? That's something we're solving for our clash and something that a lot of fintechs are identifying as a big problem in order for Africa to modernize and digitize. So I think that might be a conversation coming out of that respect. Mm -hmm. Um, anything else to add there on that on that topic, Abdul Karimu? Anything from you? Yeah, just to also add that I um, also disagree that there are no innovation in Africa um, as it is. Um, there are a lot of innovations that have come up in recent period. We've seen mobile wallets where people can move money freely. You know, we've seen uh, foreign exchange and uh, remittances where the big tech are also coming in to assist in movement of uh, uh, funds. Seamless in ac across uh, borders. Uh, we've seen real time payments where you can transfer money from your mobile phone and uh, the next person gets at the other end. So basically, there are innovations. It's just that how much of it have we seen in Africa? And uh, do we have the right infrastructure in place in terms of uh, resources to consolidate them going forward? Sure. Um, moving on to the next questions, as, as, as everyone on this panel knows, uh, e commerce has two critical components. Um, fulfillment and payment. Um, so I guess starting with you, Jess, I mean, what is in your view, is what in your view is critical for an e-commerce business to be successful in scaling into Africa from a payments perspective? I think the first thing is just knowing that 90% of all e-commerce transactions in Africa are cash-based. Um, you know, that is really critical. How does Amazon launch into Africa? As we know, they're launching in April 23 um, and serve the mass market here while collecting cash. Um, how do we digitize cash? Um, you know, Africa is a cash first economy and we're not quite there yet with payment acceptance across all 54 countries. So I think that's the first thing that, um, you know, payment companies need to look at. I think also, you know, again, accepting a multitude of different payment methods. You know, you can't get into Africa and accept card payments and accept, you know, ex 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 
expect to get to, uh, you know, economies of scale or even get significant market share. So I think that's really critical. And then lastly, I think just like refunds and settlement, you know, we know it can take up to 30 days to receive a refund here on the continent. Um, something that consumers, um, you know, aren't accepting these days as the economy becomes more digitized. I think that's really key. How do companies look at refunding customers more seamlessly as opposed to waiting for, you know, 15 to 30 days at times uh, for settlement? And that's something that e-commerce needs to address uh, critically if they're going to be able to scale. But uh, e-commerce companies are going to have to address a bit to scale across the continent. Anthony, any, any, any other comments from you on that question? Yeah, uh, I mean, like Sachman definitely uh, just already touched on, on that. I would say the infrastructure is important as well. And I'm talking about the collection, credibility, and reconciliation as well. So when you think about uh, big tech or big e-commerce going to Africa, you want to have ability to collect local currencies. At the same time, you don't want to have to worry about the FS implication of that. Um, and that's just one side of the matter. Now, once you collect the fund, how do you settle back to your headquarters or wherever your suppliers are from? So I believe to actually pay those collection um, value to the suppliers because they're selling from another continent or country is important. So you need like a, a very clean and um, smooth cross-border solution again. So I believe to actually be able to collect locally after the process of payment. Uh, one key element that I'll probably add to this is when it comes to uh, the card and the transaction of e-commerce. Uh, a solution that works in Europe, like, like the card payments that maybe using your Visa or MasterCard in the UK, might not necessarily work in Kenya. So you need like a, a localized version of the same solution, whether through local players or the international guys, localize the solution to local players or to consumers so actually be able to use their, their, their card anywhere around the world. So I would say if you want to be successful in Africa, they need to think about the infrastructure. Now, mm -hmm. they don't need to go into Africa trying to build that infrastructure from scratch. They can leverage on those local players that are doing something locally, either solving the reconciliation aspect, collection aspect, settlement aspect, all combined. And I think that's the way to win in, 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 in Africa today. Sure. Um, and moving on slightly, um, access to new markets is, is a problem for businesses um, in, in Africa. Um, what are the benefits of a frictionless payments ecosystem for African businesses? Um, Abdul Karimu, could we uh, could we start with you? Okay, right. Um, before we can classify any payment to be frictionless, uh, it therefore means that the obstacles to uh, making payment of purchases are minimized to the barest minimum. And uh, for you to consider any payment to be frictionless, it has to there should be some form of uh, fast checkout when you're filling a, a form online. The form should be very brief, summarized. And um, um, there, there should be some uh, integration uh, within the system in a way that it can interact with your other platform to a large extent. So the specific benefit will be that it will help to decrease the cut abandonment, wherein if the process is unnecessarily too long, people will abandon their purchases a lot, they, like, they may not want to complete the entire process. So the good thing here is to ensure that you have platforms that are very brief, where a customer could come in, a line or two, maybe a pager, you're done making all those payments. So if you have that in place, it encourages people to uh, individual customers to be involved in uh, um, um, more payments, whether locally or internationally. I think I'll summarize that. Um, Anthony, um, anything additional to, to add? Yeah, I think, um, like um, Shule said, uh, faster efficient payments is super important. And that would, that would obviously add to the to, to the um, efficiency experience that I think most customers want and need in Africa. Um, but I would go as far as to say the, the impact of that is actually huge. There's a there's a macro impact of doing that. So if you imagine a, a small mom and pop shop that is buying some goods and, from China, uh, maybe usually after pay thirty days in advance, to make sure that 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 money gets settled, you can get the goods on time. That's going to affect his cash flow. It's going to affect a lot of things that you could have used that money for. So imagine a situation where I'm expecting my goods to be sent uh, tomorrow and I'm not making the payment today. And that payment is getting there in real time or today. That, that changes the whole thing. So like, you're actually adding to the GDP potentially of the country or the continent because the faster I can make payments, the faster I can sell to, the quicker I can get my goods, the quicker I can sell the goods and go back to the market again. So I think 
having a very good fishing payment system will actually add value to the whole economy, not just in one country, in Africa as a whole. And and Jess, if I can bring you in finally. Absolutely. So I think frictionless payments gives access to digital trade, which is crucial, especially in Africa, which then gives you access to distant markets and facilitates seamless cross-border trade online. Um, we know that in Africa, for example, we have the fastest growing percentage of mobile subscribers, therefore opportunities for digital payments in Africa is very insurmountable. But that can only happen once we solve the issue of frictionless, seamless payments, and even going a step further, checkouts, mm -hmm. which right now on the continent is seemingly seemingly impossible, given things like OTP verification um, and having to do multiple steps to, to, to authorize the payment. I think, um, you know, once this is solved, um, you know, intra-Africa trade uh, will be able to be seamless. We'll be able to move money and goods across the continent uh, more seamlessly. Um, we know that cross-border payments, for example, can cost up to 70%. Um, so I think, you know, once we're able to remove layers in the payment value chain, we'll see a cost coming down, um, payments being made faster, and more people getting online to make payments too. I think lastly, just the introduction of ISO um, 2020. 222, um, also, you know, serve more end-to-end um, payment experience uh, for consumers wanting to send money cross-border um, and it's online. Sure. And so just moving on slightly and, and kind of touching on something that we talked about, I mean, obviously, given Africa's 40 plus currencies, we've talked about kind of, uh, you know, about the treasury and payments capabilities that big tech would require. That those 40 plus currencies mean that local currency FX risk is top of mind for all multinational corporations. Um, my question to, to the panel is, what are some of the strategies for mitigating this risk and freeing up trapped cash in local markets on the continent? Um, we start with you, um, Abadou Karimou. Okay, um, right, it ends off uh, strategies for mitigating risk it, um, for local currency FX, you could uh, basically, business strategy. Uh, you decide what your core principle and responsibility regarding uh, investments in other uh, continents will be. Uh, you can engage in uh, basically working capital financing. Apart from apart from the hedging uh, strategies that we are aware, you can also do bank partnering. Uh, you could be engaging uh, bank account uh, reporting where you have a. Uh, a single point where you consolidate all your numbers to know what the position is. That will prompt you to know if there are uh, uh, needs for you to repatriate your funds to 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 your to your environment, maybe from abroad. Um, you could also do majorly, like I said, repatriation where you do it accompanied financing, servicing, service fees charged to your um, subsidiary. Um, there could be royalty payment for service and all that. Then. Dividend payment is not uh, excluded from the strategies. In terms of trap cash, uh, they could be in two forms. Uh, you could have restricted cash, uh, which uh, are not available for your daily um, cash cycle. Then the trap cash are usually those cash that probably will not be in your vicinity, wherein you now have to deploy the strategies to ensure that you have absolute control. So always plan, for instance, to move them to your local environment as it were, depending on local regulations. But with tech, uh, movement of funds has been made so pretty easy. You could actually move funds from, despite there are still gates with that, those funds will have to go through. Uh, I will stop here. Okay. Anthony, maybe you can pick things up then? Yeah, um, I agree that most of the words was like you said. Um, I will probably go as far as, if you're, if you're a big multinational, the chances that you might have a provider already, you might have a bank that you work with, that somehow they can create some solution for you, some effects derivatives or edging solution for you to kind of mitigate that exposure. But I think there's a simpler way to do this, and that a simpler way is giving a platform or a provider that allow you to convert your currencies, whether it's trapped or not, in real time, and giving you option to keep those value in the form of a, a bank account solution or wallet that you can use at a later stage. So if you're a, a, a multinational or even SME, that uh, you are good at planning ahead, there's no reason why you cannot mitigate this without trying to be sophisticated at all. So you can just have to know that, okay, end of the month, I need X amount of this currency. You can do this change today or end of the month. 
whenever you want. But the period that you change it might determine your exposure, right? For daily basis, on a monthly basis, and plan ahead, and actually keep the value, knowing that that comments is available for you. And on the back of it, when you need to use it in form of a payout, it's smooth as well, going back to cost better payment. You can make the payment instantly or in real time or close to T plus one, compared to maybe what a local bank will offer you. I think that for me is, 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 is literally a quick solution that you don't need to be smart or sophisticated to, to use. Sure. And I kind of bet this is building on that answer slightly then, Anthony. Um, how can technology help in achieving this and, and, and minim minimizing local FX risk for multinationals? Yeah, I mean, technology is already doing that. Uh, I think that's where the, the space that Beto is in, right? So we, we have a, a lot of uh, users that either through a platform or through API, they're able to um, get access to multiple currencies in real time, they get access to uh, a real time pricing on, on those currencies. And I'm not talking about G. G10, I'm not talking about cable, pounds to dollars. I'm talking about where one sided is very liquid, which is obviously the, the big problem in Africa because a lot of these currencies are paired against US dollar and they're not, there's not enough liquidity in the market. So if you have access to a similar platform like Vector where um, you don't have to do the thinking anymore, like whatever your business is, you just run your business. Uh, if you are a big multinational that you have volume based transaction, you can do this through API. If you are uh, managing your own internal treasuries, you can literally embed that solution within your ERP solution or use a platform where you log in, digital transactions, and your money is safe because any of those solution providers should be regulated or they are actually regulated and they have the ability to keep your fund segregated from their own operational fund. So to understand, it's almost like the solutions out there. Uh, what we need is um, what we call a buying for maybe multinationals to actually keep it go. I think there's a lot of, um, uh, what's the right word, like where you're used to something. This is how we used to do it. We used to work with the biggest bank in the world. Therefore, we want to do the same in Africa. That's not going to happen today. It's probably going to take mm. years for that to happen. The guys are solving the problem are fintechs, and they're solving the most efficient way possible. So they need to start be that buying from the, the stakeholders, in this case, multinational, taking advantage of the solutions on the ground. And just finding the best providers and the best providers are already there. Sure. And, and and yes, again, same question to you. How can technology help minimize local FX risk for multinationals? Yeah, I think, you know, as Anthony said, it's 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 similar. So I think for us particularly, just creating uh, interoperability between systems to really simplify the complexity around you know, holding FX in multiple African currencies and converting that to hard currencies. Um, you know, we've managed to use technology to manage liquidity positions in different parts of the world so that our merchants are actually not having to send money cross border. They're actually tapping into liquidity pots in different parts of the world, um, which reduces cost. It's quicker. Um, if we look at companies like Wise, they've adopted the same model. Um, so I think just using technology to, technology to enable more seamless payments uh, particularly on the FX side, is something that we've heavily invested in. Um, we've looked at what are the main challenges of sending money around the world, holding um, you know, FX positions in volatile currencies like the Nigeria, Naira, Ghana, City, um, Kenya, Chilling, and really solving for that. Um, and we've used uh, technology as a vessel um, to cut down the payment value chain when it comes to payments, border especially, but also when it comes to holding liquidity positions in volatile currencies. Sure. And, and, and kind of, I'll stay with you, Jess, but um, my next question to you is then, is what is the most important aspect then of managing liquidity for, for, for uh, a multinational? I think one of the key things is, is just anticipating your liquidity needs in the different countries that you're operating in. Um, you know, I think where, where it becomes difficult is when you're looking for liquidity, where you're looking for currencies you don't have access and you're having to do quick trades to fulfill those positions, which can be very costly. Um, it can slow down things on the operational side of your business. So I think anticipating and having pots of liquid cash in different countries that you're operating in in anticipation of sales is really key. Obviously not easy for SME, but MNCs, absolutely, they should have the ability to do so. And then I think, again, just de risking the business, <coughs> ensuring that they have a seamless partner that they're working with um, to be able to take the FX off their hands once they need to execute that trade. Um, and then I think the last thing is ensuring that they have enough on the exchange spread. You know, we see companies, you know, marking prices up one to two percent to account for volatility uh, fluctuation and devaluation. 
And I think that's really key for multinationals like Amazon coming in uh, to launch into Africa and really looking at what their costs look like. Um, you know, how do how do they get to economies of scale, particularly to account for, you know, the fact that FX and liquidity will be a continuous issue um, at the end of the world in Africa. Sure. Anthony, any, any more additional insights on the same question for you, from you? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, if, if I also define what's liquidity management, you basically say it is the ability or the freedom to be able to hold multiple currencies, right? And be able to either pay out or receive money in those currencies whenever you want. So for me, the most important aspect is actually two public two aspects of it. One is the accessibility of that liquidity itself and reconciliation at the back of it. So if you're a multinational with multiple bank accounts, sub accounts, probably hundreds of them, you want to have a real time visibility of what's available within your currency, within your world, your wallet globally. Therefore, you can make some informed decisions. But if you can't reconcile properly, it means that in one minute you might be short in some currency in one corridor, the next minute you're short in another one. So having a real time access to what's happening within your, your bank accounts or sub accounts and then be able to reconcile in real time so that your upstream can almost like proactively act ahead uh, on a weekly, daily, or whatever, mini basis on where you need to move from. And I think having that solution is what is important when it comes to being able to operate in multiple countries. Um, yeah. Sure. And uh, just the, the final question before I open up um, uh, to the Q&A session um, for our audience to give um, panelists their own questions and pose some questions to them. Um, my final question for you, for you, Anthony, is um, what are some of the biggest regulatory and infrastructural challenges of uh, pan-African growth? Uh, there's a lot. Um, I mean, on the regulatory side, I think um, that that's been it's, it's been it's obvious that when it comes to Africa. We know there's a lot of regulations. Uh, in some cases, some countries are very clear on what those regulations are. In some countries, uh, you have to kind of figure out what is the black and white of that regulation. Um, but I would say, like, uh, it's getting better. Uh, a lot of the um, central banks are coming out with a, a new innovative way of allowing fintech to solve the problem. Uh, on the infrastructure side, uh, there's a lot to improve on, in Africa from transportation to communication to, to even power. Like if you start up in some of this country, if your access to internet, internet is not there, how, how do you operate? Uh, access to power, if it's not there, how do you operate? So infrastructure needs to improve um, on, on a large scale. Um, then when you think about uh, maybe on the payment aspect, which is this topic, I think that's bringing was the right direction as well. Uh, I believe not a few, few, few months ago, we had the, the PAPS, the organization that came together to try and do uh, some form of a swift payment in the continent, uh, on the continent. I think that form is a really good solution. Uh, if you can imagine the situation where you don't have to rely on US dollars to do transaction across border, and you can literally transact in real time between two different countries, that form is a good infrastructure play on, on the payment side. So there's a lot of growth, um, but overall, I would say regulatory-wise, there's a lot that's going to happen. There's a lot that needs to uh, allow foreign investment. So things like capital control, there needs to be clear regulation around it, because if I'm going to invest money, there should be a clear way for me to repatriate my return if I get any from it. So I would say a lot of things like that should, should need to be a top of mind for those um, central banks. And hopefully uh, in the next few years, we should start seeing more, more growth coming from them. And, and, and Jess, same question to you. I mean, what, what, what do you feel are the biggest regulatory and infrastructural challenges to, to pan-African growth? So at Clash Show, we're live in six African countries today. And I think one of our biggest challenges is that there's a fragmented financial regulatory framework across the continent. There's 54 countries and 44 currencies in Africa. And in order for us to scale across uh, different countries and accept payments from these countries, we have to engage with you know central banks in those respective countries and you know ensure that we're complying with whatever regulation or law, whatever regulation or the law stipulates on the ground, which can obviously be time consuming and difficult to navigate. Um, and some countries are starting to support the, the development of uh, fintech and creating more enabling environments, for example, by creating sandbox environments um, and fintechs like us are able to move faster. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of strict foreign exchange controls in some countries, which make it hard for us to maintain consistency. 
Um, and then again, there's just complex and variable regulations, including license approval processes, which can, you know, really create a difficult environment to, for us to ensure business continuity and compliance across all markets. So we've had to invest heavily um, in scaling Pan-African across the continent and, you know, ensure that we're able to navigate some of the gray areas even um, in, in some of the countries and the spaces that we're working in to ensure we're compliant with the, um, with the regulation and the laws. Um, thank you all for your time. I mean, I, I've now kind of want to open it up to um, a bit of a live Q&A. Um, from, from our audience. There's a lot of questions flooding in. Um, I, I, I kind of think the one that stood out to me, one of the top ones was, um, and I think maybe this would be perfect for you, Anthony and Jess, but um, so the question is, um, how do you see Pan-African Payment and Settlement, uh, sorry, the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, so PAPS, evolving to provide effective, fast and cheap cross-border payments? Any one from our panel happy uh, to take that together? Yeah, I'm happy to take that. Uh, I actually think it's a very good initiative. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking from the point of view of what is happening in the European side. And for example, like SWIFT payments is used today, it's been around for God knows three or four decades. Um, a lot hasn't really changed until recently in terms of innovation. And the only people that can plug into our banks, and it has to be big international banks as well. And that is probably going to be the only detrimental to PAPS as a solution. Uh, my understanding is that obviously they want to connect with Central Bank of each country and then the local banks can connect to the same network of rails and that will allow real-time settlement and so on. Amazing solution. It will remove the need to be doing cross borders using foreign currencies to start with. It will make real-time settlement in those currencies as well. What would not be nice is if they follow the same strategy as what we did, where you only allow many big banks to connect it to that situation um, it should be open up for fintech. It should be open up to, to disruptors, guys that actually want to solve the problem. They should open up their wells for other people to build on top of it so that we actually get a much more faster solution, better solution overall. Uh, so personally, I think it's a great idea. Now, the issue is you need to get buy-in from almost every country to start with. Those countries need to have enough liquidity or they need to at least have settlements available in place. You can't have any risk or any other systemic risk or infrastructure risk coming from any you know, of the country because that will kind of affect the whole solution. So a lot of things need to happen from any member state that want to join that, 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 that um, initiative. And more importantly, there has to be a way to regulate it in the most transparent way. There has to be a way for that regulation around it to be very, very flexible, like taking on any challenges and literally keep updating the essence of the solution. It can't just be another solution, another initiative that never really take off. Thanks. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with Anthony. And I think once we see uh, PAPS really picking up across the continent, we'll also see an increase in intra-Africa trade. Um, we saw the you know Africa continental free trade area um, introduced not too long ago. So we should see more trade between countries. Um, it would definitely help their economy and, and boost digital trade as well, which I'm really looking forward to. Aaron, are you audible? Or is it just me? I do apologize. I don't know what happened there. Sorry, so the, the, the question another question from our from our audience was um around ISO twenty oh twenty two. So they're eager to know what our panel thinks of the payments messaging standard, which obviously will start in November twenty twenty two. So where does Africa stand in terms of migration to this payment messaging format? Anthony, are you happy to handle that one? Yeah, I mean, like, I think, again, it's an update to existing solution or existing format of the payment system is going to be really good from um, for messaging and international payment point of view, again, using USD and so on. But our problem is in USD payment, in my view. The African problem is the lack of interoperability between the local uh, currencies that are being used locally 
Like, mm -hmm. why should you have to cause for another currency to cause back to another currency for a neighboring country, right? So I think for mm -hmm. me, the, the solution should be, we should be looking at like internal solution, example that we just talked about, use of PAPS, should be something that we should be looking towards actually building properly when it comes to infrastructure. Um, sure. The ongoing reliance on international uh, G10 currencies to set to local payments is not efficient. Like it's only gonna be more costly and so on. Like how many banks in Africa do we think are going to be able to uh, implement the solution in real time and very quickly, probably not many. In fact, some of them are relying on corresponding bank anyway, to even do their cost better payments. So in a way, is it really going to have much effect on Africa uh, as a whole? Uh, I, I would like to see. Um, but I think the, the better solution is actually solving the intra-African problem, allowing mm -hmm. local currency uh, ability to swap Kenyan shilling to Nigerian Naira in real time without having to cross between euros or dollars a pound. Sure. Um, Jess, any any additional thoughts on on ISO um, on ISO twenty o twenty two? Yeah, I'm actually really looking forward to it uh, coming into effect. I think for us, one of the biggest problems in cross-border payments is triggering the payment and uh, communication coming maybe five to six days after from the receiving bank about additional information um, or maybe things that have been left out in you know, the payment uh, description upon us sending the payment, for example. And um, particularly when sending money to places like China. So I think the, the ease of messaging, the simplification of that um, messaging, I think, will be really critical for us. Um, just given the volume of transactions we're handling right now and some of the challenges that are coming about, I agree with Anthony um, fundamentally. But I think that any improvement to messaging, communication, and the swiftness of cross-border payments will make for a more meaningful business on our side, and also will delight and delight our merchants more than we are now. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I'm keen to see how it will translate uh, to the African ecosystem. Of course, payments and the cross-border payments especially is more nascent hair on the ground than OECD economies and front-end markets. But I think the the ease of messaging um, and, and, and the kind of simplification of it will definitely assist in us making swifter transactions. Perfect. Um, any additional insights from you, Abidu Karimu, on, uh, ISO, on ISO 2022 in terms of its... Um, migration um, uh, uh, in terms of migration and the payment system, the payment format at all? Nothing more additional? Okay. Um, another question from our audience. Um, so what strategies can businesses employ for trade, for, uh, for trade cross-border um, in a situation where there is a tight exchange control policy? Um, Anthony, any, any thoughts there? Uh, what strategies can a business employ? Yeah. So last question. In a. So we repeat uh, the last so part it, of the question. It was it asked what 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 are the strategies to employ for trade, um, with regards to cross border payment in a situation where there is a tight exchange control policy. Um, well, I think first and foremost, you probably want to do whatever you're going to do in the most compliant way. Otherwise, it's going to affect you as a business anyway. So I would say whatever the regulations is or whatever the tight controls are, you want to play within that to start with. Um, but outside that, there's always a way to um, potentially manage that risk and that part of it being proactive. Uh, for example, there are a few countries in Africa where we operate today where there's some form of tight control exchange uh, around the effects and so on. And what we do is we try to make sure that either we regulate it locally or we work with local players that are regulated that are allowed to do those transactions. I would say you want to work within that framework. Um, mm -hmm. Now, a lot of problems that comes with that is you might not be able to get the right solution with some of those frameworks as well. So you need to find a way around it. Uh, a good example would be in a country like Kenya where uh, it's very tight when it comes to uh, exchange control and so on. But at the same time, it's very clear on what you need to do if you are either remitting money into the country or you need to pay your suppliers outside the country. And there are very clear regulations around who are the key players, whether it's a bank and so on. And how does the reporting at the back of that happens? So there's a lot of solutions out there. Uh, I would just say I'll, I'll probably need more context now for me to give advice on which part of these countries or continent we're talking about. But overall, I would say as long as you want to be compliant, there's a way to work within that compliance and actually get a better solution. A lot of fintech already in this space 
Vector, for example, this is the space that we operate in. And our solution is to simplify some of these problems for businesses like probably what do you want to ask the question. And our way of doing is we go on the ground, we localize our solution, we make sure we're compliant from a red point of view. We work with the uh, within the directives or with the with the regulators where possible. But more importantly, we want to give you that liquidity, that accessibility in the most efficient way. And you don't have to spend two days or two months waiting for your payment to be exchange or so your efforts to be exchanged and then do payment at the back of that we make everything streamlined fictionalized in a way and probably settle within minutes or hours or day and that's basically uh just in a few countries that we're in so i think there are a lot of processes or solutions out there just a matter of finding what's the best approach based on your own uh, exposure and your own regulatory uh, framework as well um yes anything anything to add to me yeah, I just think to add to what Anthony is saying, um, you know, typically or historically in Africa, there have been tight capital controls against cross-border payments, sending foreign currencies across borders. And I think, you know, just as a start, I don't know what stage this person is in their business, but as a start, look for companies maybe like Clasher, maybe like Verto, who um, accept payments in African countries and then can, you know, pay out in, from different parts of the world, right? So money isn't exactly crossing the border. So I think there's smart ways for people to, you know, ensure that they're compliant because that is number one for us here at Kasha, but also, you know, to ensure that they're able to actually execute the transaction. So, you know, there's various ways you can, you know, send Naira to Kasha, for example, and then we'll send you the hard currency in, you know, in the US, UK, India, China. So I think there's a lot of companies that have sold for this already. I think partnering with one uh, is definitely key at the beginning. And then reverse engineering what that payment uh, value chain looks like um, while ensuring that you're on the right side of the law, uh, given how stringent, stringent it is right now on the continent. Sure. And, and one, uh, another, an, another question from our audience as well, they kind of wanted us to, I guess, the panel to dig a little bit deeper into one of their answers um, that we, we talked about previously. So given the risks that, um, you know, the panel identified in terms of liquidity, local currency regulations, etc., cetera, um, what are your views on the parallel FX market in Nigeria for cross-border payments in US dollar? Um, they ask, you know, given the disparity between the parallel and central bank rates, um, are companies taking the FX risk for the sake of liquidity? So, yeah, are, are companies taking the FX risk for the sake of liquidity, in your opinion? And, Anthony oh, or Jeff? Something. Yeah, I'll give a brief answer. I mean, some companies are taking okay. the FX risk for the sake of liquidity. Um, you know, that that's a very, I mean, that's very hard to scale. Um, yes, there is a big dichotomy between the parallel market rate and the, the central, you know, the central banking rate here in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 becoming increasingly obvious, you know, as, as times, uh, as the months have gone on most recently, I would say. Um, but yes, yeah, some companies are having to take the FX ticket just to remain competitive and just to access the, the FX. Now, there's smart ways around it. For example, you know, we may stock up on dollars um, when the exchange rate is favorable so that we're not acting directly in the parallel market rate, not scrambling for dollars um, when we need it the most. So I think there's like contingencies you can build in in anticipation of market changes. Um, given, you know, the economic shift we've had this year and we, you know, we take that position in multiple different African countries that we operate in. Sure. And Anthony, any additional thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the answer is yes. So uh, some companies are definitely less risk or even the, um, yeah, the exposure to the effects as well. Um, because like, what is the alternative? You can either sit on your Naira, uh, and hopefully at some point, um, the rates are just itself and so on. But ultimately, it's not something that, at least over the last few months, it yes, it seems like it keeps going up. So the longer you, your long Naira, probably larger your exposure, of course. So at some point, you have to take like an hard line that, okay, I'm gonna benchmark my rates against a uh, parallel market where I potentially can get liquidity out quickly. And your other option is you go for the official route and you uh, at some point hopefully you will get some of those uh, exchange currencies that you needed uh, but obviously over the last 18 months that hasn't been uh, the most efficient way but hasn't been effective to an extent so yes a company has taken the risk and i would say if you're a company that you have exposure to the effects in general probably the best time mm -hmm. to start baking that effects into your pricing as well 
uh, given the state of, of, the, of the country over the last 18 months. So in a way, you don't have to like foot the bills on how much exposure you, you are exposed to uh, in a long time. So and I think a lot of uh, smart companies nowadays are actually doing that uh, on, on their pricing. It's not good for consumers. It's not good for the economy. But ultimately, if you are not profitable as a business or break even, you're probably not going to exist another months or years. So I think the answer is you, you have to. Um, but there are smarter way of doing it, like I said. You don't necessarily have to do it at the most expensive time. Like this is where uh, having solution providers that kind of give you real-time pricing. And once you have your benchmark of price, you can go into the market in that moment and try and get, to get your, your USD or your cost border payment. If you don't get something, you can just sit on your Naira. It's not going anywhere. And hopefully with that just, uh, I'm confident at some point, all of this stuff will, will change for the better. Um, but it's, there's a long way to get there. And you have to kind of see whether you can, you can literally stay around for that period or you can have to uh, get into the exposure and, and get your money out. And, and I'm conscious of time, so we've just got the last few questions now just for our panel. And um, one of the final ones is, so w what are the key sort of uh, ways or tips that organizations can navigate cross-border payment challenges when striving to grow their reach in Africa? Um, open to whoever wants to kick that off. Any interest from you to start that off, Sully? No? Um, Anthony, any, any thoughts on Anthony. that question? Anthony, do so you want to take it? Uh, you can go first. Uh, uh, Jess? Okay, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, okay, okay. So the question was, uh, what are the, um, the key... Uh, what, what, are the, what are some of the key... Yeah, what are some of the sort of like key ways and tips organizations that you have for organizations so that they can navigate cross-border payment challenges um, when looking to grow their reach in Africa? Yeah, I think, I think the first part of it is um, like when, when you go into any country in general, uh, at least when you, it's about market expansion, for example, number one, you want mm -hmm. to know that there's a local solution available for you in, in your market. And that local solution is, um, like I said earlier, ability to be able to collect your fund easily um to collect it and potentially be able to do whatever you want to do with that fund so you might need a, a good uh a bank account or banking relationship or a good payment process or a good fintech that does that for you then the second part is, is can i um, confidently keep my fund with that organization in case if i have to keep money in there and so on and you want to do that safely as well then the top part is your effects as well which is already touched on like can i Gets us to a good FS pricing whenever I want. So accessibility is super important. Uh, you cannot control the price, so you have to be smart and nimble at the same time. You have to have a good finance team that, that are proactively looking at the market and knowing when it's the best time to get in or get out. And the last part is like payments, like I just mentioned earlier, being able to move money quickly in real time, knowing that if you send money today, it's going to be there tomorrow, you can trace in real time, there's no issues around my money gets stuck between three or four correspondent banks. So in a way, you need a, a fintech or a banking partner, so whoever that is a provider, that potentially is closing the gap between one sending bank and the receiving bank. You don't want to have multiple intermediary in the middle. You want to have one or two, if, if anything not. That way, your money can get started quickly. Um, but I would say all in all, like when you're doing any market expansion, one of the key things is to have both sides of the market as, as a business. So if you're employing locally, you don't need to impact it for your fund. You should be able to use that local fund to pay your, your employees. If you are buying stuff locally as well, you can use some of those funds. But it's not always the case that you have to send money to convert locally. You can use the money that you generate locally to actually add value to the economy. So I would say, um, yeah, you go do all of that to, to be successful, in my view. Sure. Yeah, just I mean, any just to add to what Anthony, yeah, just to add to what Anthony is saying, just really investing in, like, building interoperability between systems and, you know, working with fintechs, you know, like Clasher, for example, to help you deal with that cross-border and that last, that cross-border payment and that last mile. 
uh, payment too. I think really focusing on kind of building and interconnecting uh, kind of fast payment infrastructure to allow for more seamless payments is going to be really critical. What that looks like is creating, you know, a payment value chain that has the least amount of hops, you know, we, sometimes it's six to seven hops to complete a payment between, uh, you know, the UK and Hong Kong, for example, um, or even Nigeria and Senegal. Um, so really trying to invest in that value chain, reducing the number of players that you're dealing with, I think is going to be key to also help increase margins. Um, Cross-border payments can cost up to 7% at times, and that's you know really expensive, especially at scale. Um, and then I think just investing in like a deep infrastructure connection, um, again, to reduce uh, the hops along the value chain will be really critical for this individual wanting to scale their business. I think also partnering with, with fintechs, as I mentioned, is going to be key. Um, fintechs or some fintechs have figured out what it looks like to send money cross-border. And at times, they're not actually sending money cross-border. They have liquid positions, as I mentioned earlier, in multiple different countries, which means that it can be cheaper and faster to send the money um, from one country to another. Um, so I think that's my, you know, that's my take uh, on that question, but happy to expand after the call if this person also wants to reach out directly. Cool. Thank you. Um, I'm sort of conscious of time, as I said. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for today's session, um, but sadly, we have to, this has to come to an end. Um, as I said, I'd like to thank all of our panellists for sharing their insights around the topic of cross-border payments in Africa. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who's joined us um, and in the audience for this webinar as well. I, I hope you've gained as much insight from it as I have, and, and I do hope that you'll join us again with the Global Treasurer. Uh, until then, thank you all, and uh, goodbye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.